Uh, all right, thanks for waiting, guys. Uh, my name is Rob Moritz from ASU, and I guess something that happens when you come towards the end of the, uh, the meetings is that you, you might be prone to covering some things that have already been covered. Um, so if that's the case, um, I hope that maybe I can add a new perspective to it, um, in addition to maybe some other things that we haven't covered today. Um, so I, I decided to break my talk down into three parts, and not all of these are, are listed on the, uh, the program. So I hope you'll forgive me for indulging in, in some other things. Um, first part is virus crystallography. I work in Brenda Hogue's lab, and uh, most of you guys know Brenda. She's a virologist. And so I wanted to provide the perspective of crystallography from, from the virology standpoint. And the second part is controlling crystal size, which we've already talked about a little bit today. And the third part is scaling up from vapor diffusion drops to batch volumes, which is important for a lot of the LCLS work that we do. And so just to begin with, um, here's an image of the Zimbus virus, which is what I primarily work with. Uh, this is a, a nice diagram where you can see the, the envelope proteins on the outside and the capsid proteins on the inside. And then there would be RNA on the inside. And I start with this image just to kind of provide a perspective of the size difference between a, a virus and um, a protein. And so the constituent proteins of the virus would be like the E1 and the E2 that are out here, and then the capsid proteins here. And then numerically, um, those proteins, the E1 protein, for instance, is 4.7 times 10 to the fourth grams per mole. And then the, the mass of the virus as a whole particle is about three orders of magnitude larger than that. So, so that's the, the, the difference that we need to think of, and most of that has application to our unit cells when we're thinking about crystallography. What are the dimensions? Oh, uh, the dimensions of that particular virus is 70 nanometers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I could also discuss this in terms of the, uh, uh, the diameter, but of course proteins aren't perfectly round like viruses are, so sometimes that doesn't translate as well. But that's another way to think of it too. Um, so. When we crystallize viruses, the, the, uh, the techniques and the principles of crystallization don't really change that much in terms of setting things up in crystal trays, um, testing different conditions, things like that. As, as far as I know, there's not a huge variation there, but the biggest variation is, is how those crystals diffract once they're produced. So uh, comparing here two crystals that would be of equal size volume, um, and this isn't to scale, by the way, uh, but you have a protein crystal versus a virus crystal, shooting an x-ray beam through them, um, the beam is going to interact with a lot more unit cells in a protein crystal than it would in a virus crystal. And so this has a lot of implications for how, um, how diffraction takes place afterwards. Um, one part of that is that there, uh, that there are going to be more Bragg peaks. There's going to be a higher density of Bragg peaks um, because uh, in, in a virus crystal versus a protein crystal. And incidentally, those, those Bragg peaks are going to be lower in intensity. So it's been estimated that uh, the intensity difference can be um, around 1,000, if not more. So, so you have a, a, an intensity distributed among more Bragg peaks, and also those Bragg peaks are going to be closer together, and we've talked about this a little bit already today. So here's a, a picture um, of a diffraction pattern from, from a rhinovirus to 1.5 angstroms. And you can see that there's quite a few data points there. So that's a, a lot of data to process. So this, when we're collecting data from a virus crystal, it may require more processing than, than perhaps a protein crystal would, assuming that it diffracts to really high resolution. And I'm going to point out that the rhinovirus is a non-envelope virus. And non-envelope viruses traditionally need to diffract to a much higher resolution than envelope viruses do. This is a, an image of diffraction from the, the Calpi mosaic virus that we collected in our lab. The previous um, image was, was synchrotron data from a published paper, but this is something that we collected. I'm just um, including as well. Yeah. The, uh, the first one that I showed, or the second one? Yeah, to be honest, I, I don't know the, the solvent content. I don't have that. Um, that information on hand at the moment. Uh, but this particular one, it's, it might be mentioned in the paper. I have the reference down here below. This is uh, the structure determination of a common cold virus, human rhinovirus. First author is Arnold, but this is a paper out of uh, Michael Rossman's lab in 1987. 
another thing to consider too is is the orientation of uh, what's inside of the unit cell. So viruses are symmetric particles. Not all viruses, but the icosahedral viruses, which are a lot of the ones that we use for, for crystallography, um, have a certain inherent symmetry to them. And this isn't going to be found in, in a protein necessarily, or certainly not to the order that you would see it in a virus. Um, this is useful because it can be used for, uh, for redundancy if you can find partial information about uh, about the structure, it can be translated to other parts of the structure through uh, through symmetry operations. And um, it's also been used for phasing as well, uh, from the non-crystallographic symmetry uh, that, that exists in viruses. Um, so this is just for comparison, the diffraction that we collected from the Symbis virus of EXFEL, which is a, a, an envelope virus. And as I, I mentioned a minute ago, these typically diffract to a lower resolution. Um, so, uh, so this is one of the, the lower resolution patterns here that's out to about 40 angstroms. Uh, maybe I should say that's medium resolution, not, not, not lower resolution, but lower than, than what we would see with an envelope, or I mean a non-envelope virus. So in this experiment, one of the things that we did was measure diffraction from crystals that were about 25 uh, microns across versus diffraction from crystals that were about 50 microns across. These were about the biggest crystals I figured that we could shoot uh, in, in the nozzle of the XFL beam, just to see if there was any differences in, in uh, the resolution or the quality of the diffraction. And, and here's just some data that we collected from, uh, or a graph that, uh, of the data that we collected that shows a comparison of what we see in the 25 micron crystals represented here in blue versus the 50 micron crystals represented in red. We didn't really see a huge difference in terms of um, what the diffraction limit was. And it's possible that uh, we would need to measure a larger um, range of sizes in order to, to notice that. But I think that, I mentioned this because I think that if you're going to be going to the XFEL and doing like a screening beam time, uh, that it's worth considering uh, shooting crystals of different sizes if you, can, if you can control that to see where you get the best resolution or the best diffraction quality. Um, because as we've mentioned so far today, um, that is something that can be a factor in your data. So I want to use that to kind of transition to the next part of my talk, which is how do we go about controlling the size of our crystals? Um, here's a picture of virus single particles and then going on to the crystals. So I'll be talking about the path that takes place between. Um, we've had a lot of phase diagrams already today, I know, and I'm going to add more to that. Uh, but it's, as we all know, these are useful for discussing the principles involved. So I want to start with the question, what is the precipitant? When we talk about um, setting up crystal trays, uh, we, we always include a precipitant. And I think the first answer that most people would give to that is, is the precipitant is PEG. That is, of course, correct. But I want to kind of expand that definition to, to think of the precipitant as being anything that decreases solubility. Um, uh, because that's essentially the job of the precipitant. So you could add to that list, if you want to be very liberal, things like temperature, salt, pH, glycerol, and even the concentration of the protein itself. All of these things affect how, um, how, how precipitation or nucleation, I should say, will take place within the drop and the end outcome of the crystal. Yeah? Uh, what, what was crystal structure? So it must be I mean, has it got some rotation for it? The, uh, the Symbis virus that I was mentioning? Uh, yes, it does. It, it has a, it's, a, it's an icosahedron, and so it has a, a five-fold symmetry uh, about the vertices, and uh, it has a symmetry about the faces and about the, the sides as well. Uh, but the, the structure of that hasn't been solved. Only um, diffraction has been reported. It, well, the structure is based on, on EM data uh, combined with uh, crystallography data from the, the individual proteins. So he was asking about the space group. Oh, the space group. Well, um, based on the data that we collected at the XFEL, uh, we determined that it's a, it appears to be a rhombohedral space group. Uh, I don't think we've, we've defined exactly uh, which one. Uh, previously, it was reported to be an R32 space group. So the data that we came up with um, actually showed a, a different space group. And it was indexed last week, first time. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's something that Nadia has been working on. So, so that's interesting. I don't have a full explanation for why that is, um, but, but that's the best I can answer that question at this point. Uh huh. So I just want to say, that it, it, it says that individual the individual Difference in the fivefold symmetry about that axis. I mean, you, you'd have it in two dimensions, but not the third dimension, right? And this this is what Michael Rossman has developed for doing non-crystallographic symmetry that's that's applied to viruses for solving the phases. And, and that's something that I I might be wrong, but I don't think you can use that technique with most protein crystals. I mean, a simple example is just sphere instead of icosahedron. Okay, and um, if you put the icosahedron at the origin, you can close pack them in a lattice just the same way that you close pack. If you get solvent contacts at excess of 60%, so, um, solvent content below 40%. I think the point is it could be several of the viruses. Right. Well, actually, typically what we see are one or two viruses per unit cell. We don't see large numbers of them in, in the unit cell. Okay, so when we're moving to make um, to make crystals smaller, say we already have conditions for, for making big crystals, but we want to make them smaller. Um, what's happening in the phase diagram? So we have more nucleation and and less um, less metastable crystal growth. So the, the crystal growth path is smaller, but there's more nucleated particles for crystal growth. And so that's that's how the phase diagram would be changing if we were to, to draw that out. Um, the first thing that I want to reference before I get into some of the work that I've done is, is a very useful paper, or at least a paper that's been useful for me, um, about uh, how to control the size of lysozyme crystals. And uh, one of the authors of this paper is, is George Phillips, who just uh, spoke before me. So you could probably tell me a little bit more about it, but it's from 2004. But I think it has some very nice images of um, some scanning electron microscope uh, pictures of crystals. And we've already talked a little bit today about uh, TEM images of, of crystals. Uh, this, this is a nice way to show how uh, SEM would be useful for looking at nanocrystals as well. So in this case, they changed, or the variable was temperature. Uh, they went from one degree to seven degrees Celsius. And they also, uh, in all these images that I'll show, went from a range of three mgs per mil to eight mgs per mil of the lysozyme protein. And you can clearly see how, how those factors affect the size of the crystals. It's interesting that in 2010, Elmer tried cross-linking lysozyme as a method of making nanocrystals. Based on your work, you really thought that it was a spectacular failure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, is it a general method? Yeah. I have no idea if it's general or not. We were interested in making small lysozyme crystals for a completely different purpose, but it seemed to uh, work in this case. Yeah, this was a 2005 paper, and it really proved to be useful for yeah, what we're doing now. of the cross-linking? Was it to improve diffraction quality? or uh, Because in some cases, cross-linking a, a crystal doesn't appear to affect diffraction, and perhaps in other cases it does. Uh, it just depends on the crystal, I suppose. Um, but anyway, note here that, the, uh, that as you increase the protein concentration, the crystals tend to get smaller. Um, that's going to be the same in, in all of these slides. 
So here's a look at um, the effect of pH. Um, not a huge pH range, just going from 3 to 4, had a pretty big effect on the size, well, had a moderate effect on the size of the crystals, but looking at it in terms of the, the mixed for milk um, as well, uh, produced a, 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 big, a bigger range in sizes. And pH is maybe not something that would be the first thing that you would try. Um, it might be a little bit more difficult to, to control than other things like protein concentration, um, but it's something to consider as well. Um, and here's a look at sodium chloride concentration. Uh, a lot of times in our buffers, we'll, we'll have some amount of sodium chloride, whether it's in the precipitin or in the sample buffer. And uh, here you can see that a, a high sodium chloride concentration generated bigger crystals. So all of, these, all of these cases here were controlling of just one of the variables that we have in a, in a crystal tray. And I want to talk a little bit more about some other variables too. Um, first, here's a look at an application of one of these, the, the concentration of the sample, and how that affected um, the Simbis virus that I work with. And here I found that it had the opposite effect um, than it did in my design. So increasing my concentration of the virus in the crystal drop um, made bigger virus crystals. In my design, that would make smaller crystals. So that's uh, one more piece of evidence to support the idea that in spite of in spite of theory or in spite of what we may have observed with other samples, we just don't know until we try something in crystallography because there are so many variables at play. Okay, so an easy thing that we can do, and we've talked about this already today, um, is, is varying the ratio of, of your precipitant to your sample and your drop. So I wanted to share some uh, the results of some experiments that I did where I used a 10 microliter drop uh, for vapor diffusion and I changed the ratio of, of precipitant to sample uh, from from having no precipitant in all sample all the way up to having nine microliters of precipitant in one microliter of sample. And as you're kind of going across, as you're increasing sample um, proportions, you're also decreasing precipitant proportions. And so you're controlling everything that's that's along with the sample, the buffer and the sodium chloride in this case, um, in concert with with the things that you're decreasing over here. So it's is controlling multiple variables at the same time rather than just one. And all of these um, parts that I've marked with green are where I observed crystals. And so here's here's a look at what's happening on the phase diagram as as you're as you're changing the ratio and increasing the amount of precipitant versus the amount of sample. Um, uh, you're moving the starting point on the phase diagram versus where you had it before, um, both in terms of um, well, more, more so in terms of protein concentration, uh, but also in terms of precipitant concentration, I believe. So here's a look at, at the crystals that resulted from that. And it's, it's very notable the difference between having a, um, a drop ratio of 4 microliters precipitant and 6 microliter sample um, up to a 1 to 1 ratio, um, the size difference that you observe there in those crystals at least. And then moving along up here, as we get into these really small um, crystals, it's, it becomes difficult to tell whether their crystals are amorphous precipitate, and I just haven't done the analysis on that. But you, you definitely see the trend there. So another approach to take um, to controlling tr crystal size that we haven't talked about yet today uh, is, is another easy way to do this, is to have your, your sample mixed. In, in this case, I just had a, um, my, my drop mixed one-to-one -one, um, precipitant to sample, and then and then further control the ratio by mixing that with a small amount of water. So essentially what you're doing is, is diluting with the sample um, at the initial condition. So this is diluting everything, the precipitant um, uh, solutes as well as the sample solutes. So, so here I did one microliter of water versus uh, mixed in with nine microliters of the mixed drop and increase that up to um, uh, 10 microliters of the mixed drop and, and no water, which would just be the normal standard conditions. And it, again, the green spots are, are marking where crystallization occurred. So again, the change um, on how it affects the, the phase diagram, uh, this, this all has to do with how things start out and not so much with where they end up. Um, they should all end up at about the same point for the path that they take to get there and the kinetics um, that are involved in getting there as well. Um, or what's changing. Uh, so here you can see increasing crystal sizes, or, or I should say decreasing crystal sizes according to um, 
how much water I added to the drop. When I added, you know, eight parts water versus two parts of the, the mixed drop, um, I got pretty small crystals. And then this would be the, the standard size of, or close to the standard size of crystals that I would have gotten. And so, anyway, this is this is a pretty easy thing to do once you've already established the crystallization conditions for your sample. Um, and just as a side note, another thing that I tried doing was changing the reservoir volume. I think typically when we set up crystal trays, we'll put 500 microliters in the reservoir. And I was curious to see what would happen if I went all the way up to um, 1,100 microliters and all the way down to 5 microliters with a 10 microliter drop. And for me, this didn't really seem to have a huge effect on, on the outcome of the crystals. But um, this may have, uh, affect uh, another sample differently. Um, I was expecting it to affect the rate of diffusion, but um, and that may have been the case, but it just didn't have a huge effect on, on my particular sample. Okay, so moving on to the next part of my talk, um, I want to talk about how to, to well, once you've established your crystallization conditions in a vapor diffusion drop, how to scale that up to a batch volume and what you need to know in order to do that. Um, so thinking about what occurs during vapor diffusion, usually we have um, water moving from the drop to the reservoir and the drop in, uh, consequently uh, shrinking and increasing the solute concentration of everything that's in there. So one, one way to, to calculate what I'm calling the equilib equilibration factor, and I'll talk more about why uh, we need that in a moment, is to just do it empirically by, um, by knowing what your volume is that you start with in your drop, um, say it's 10 microliters versus what it is after e equilibration takes place. Um, usually it'll decrease down to six or seven microliters if you're starting with a 10 microliter drop. And so you'd have to set up several drops and then measure the volume after it's equilibrated and try to come up with some estimate based on that, which can be a little bit challenging because there's always a little bit of water that sticks to the cover slide that you can't really measure with a micro pipette. Um, so that should give you a good estimate, I, I suppose, of, uh, of, of what the equilibration factor is. You take the initial volume and divide by the, the final volume. Um, a more complicated and precise way to do it is by actually doing the math, and this is going to involve a spreadsheet. And I'm going to try to explain this to the best of my ability. Um, so feel free to interrupt me with questions if I'm not clear about this. Um, I have a, an example calculation that will follow uh, on the slides after this one. So, so this starts by taking the sum of the concentration of each of the ions in your precipitant. Um, and you want to make sure that you're using the same units for this, so moles per liter. And if you have a percent peg, you need to convert that to moles per liter as well. And then dividing by uh, the, the sum of the ion concentrations that are in the mixed drop, um, so the initial conditions. Uh, so when you add all of, all of these up and all of those up and divide them, you get the equilibration factor. And that should be pretty close to um, what you would get from the empirical method that I just explained. Um, so once you have the equilibration factor, you're going to take uh, the concentration of ions that are in the initial draw um, that you're beginning with and multiply each of those individually by the equilibration factor. And that will give you the, the, co the final concentration of each of those ions, what they should be in the drop when it's finally equilibrated. Um, so I represent that here. So just to kind of go through a calculation here on a spreadsheet, this is this is taken from um, the work that I do with SINDIS. So these are you know, my actual values from a real spreadsheet um, where I have in my precipitant PEG, glycerol, and potassium chloride and the, uh, the concentration of each of those. And then in, in the mixed drop, in this case I'm mixing it um, at a ratio of one to one, I have everything that's in the precipitant that just in half the concentration as well as everything that's in the drop of my sample, the pipes, buffer, sodium chloride, and in this case, I'm even including uh, sodium from uh, adding uh, sodium hydroxide to adjust the pH. So if you, if you want to be very specific, and I would recommend being that specific, um, you should measure how much HCl or NaOH you're adding to adjust the pH uh, in your buffer. And so when I add up the molarity of, of each of those individual things from the precipitant, and I divide by the same thing from, from the mixed drop, um, I get a value of 1.594. And so the next thing that I do is I take that value, 1.594, and I multiply it by each of the individual um, components of the mixed drop to get the final concentration of each of those drops. 
after equilibration. So, um, so once you, you have that equilibration factor uh, and you have an idea of, of basically what the final concentration of each of those solutes is going to be in your drop after equilibration, you can then reproduce that um, using other methods that allow you to work with larger volumes than a vapor diffusion drop does. So um, I've already talked about vapor diffusion. I think we all understand that pretty well. Um, what I like to use for it, though, just as a side note, are these these um, these these plates that are made by Kiagen, where they instead of working with vacuum grease, they just have a cover slide that you can screw on. I think they're useful in terms of um, being able to manipulate the drop if you need to. And I I might be superstitious, but I I feel like they're a little bit more reproducible than something with vacuum grease that can maybe not form as, as good of a sill as you think it does um, each time that you do it. Um, so dialysis is kind of my method of choice, and I apologize for the, uh, uh, the text here, um, not transferring very well, but um, I think that the path to, to nucleation that dialysis follows um, is, is fairly close to what you would see with vapor diffusion, maybe more so than in some of the other methods that I'll talk about. So in the case of dialysis, you just want to know what the, the final concentration of the equilibration is um, that you calculated from your equilibration factor, and then you dialyze your sample directly into that. And there are things that you can control during dialysis that affect the rate of that, um, such as what the pore size of the dialysis membrane you're using is, or if, if you're going to be stirring it. Um, uh, and, and so there's, there might be some further tweaking that you need to do um, after, uh, after you've transfer to your dialysis um, or your vapor diffusion method over to dialysis. So these are some dialysis uh, photolyzers is what they're called. These work well um, because they, they don't, the volume doesn't change on them. It stays pretty constant, maybe more so than another dialysis equipment. Um, but I've had success using uh, the dialysis cassettes. Uh, so uh, you guys have probably seen these before. You just inject your sample in there with a needle. And here's Here's a look at uh, some Simbus crystals um, that I formed in the dialysis cassette by transferring uh, the uh, transferring from what, what I learned from vapor diffusion drops and, and doing the math. Um, so here's a, a nice, you can, maybe you can't see it very well, but there's some crystals there that you can kind of see, and here's a close-up of those crystals. They turned out to be larger than they would have been um, from vapor diffusion, uh, but again, not everything transfers directly, and you still might have to do some tweaking to control things like crystal size. Okay, so another approach that you can take is is a, a crystallization by concentrating in one of those centrifuge concentrators. And this might not be the first place that you would start, and I probably wouldn't do this if your crystals aren't very robust, but you can you can scale up from a small um, concentrator up to a bigger concentrator if things work out well for you. In this case, um, you're just concentrating down to the final equilibration um, conditions that you've established. And so the, the concentration of the solutes in the precipitant don't really change, um, but the concentration of the protein is the only thing that's changing uh, during, uh, during that approach. Um, free interface diffusion is, is a very popular method. A lot of you guys are already familiar with it. So in this case, you have um, your more dense precipitant on the bottom overlaid with, with your protein, and you just allow that to sit and, and slowly diffuse, and the crystals will sink to the bottom there. And um, you'll need to know what the final um, precipitant concentration is uh, to mix into that. This is, the, this is the only approach where the concentration of protein on the phase diagram that you start with is greater than it is uh, where you end up with. So uh, there may be some issues in transferring uh, the vapor diffusion approach to this, but it is something that you can set up using PCR tubes in a screen uh, with small volumes and then scale that up pretty easily. And then batch mix we've already talked about today, so you just go straight directly to the um, the nucleation conditions or the equilibrated state and mix everything together and just let it sit. And if, if you try all of this and, and you still have troubles or you're not getting the crystals that you want, um, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would propose what I'm calling a serial vapor diffusion method. So this is just doing the vapor diffusion drops that you're already familiar with but scaling up 
clean out what you do and setting up a whole bunch of drops. And the question that I would ask yourself is, is the effort to establish batch conditions greater than the effort to prepare and harvest a whole bunch of vapor diffusion drops? The answer to that question is yes, then, then maybe just set up a whole bunch of vapor diffusion drops and, and stick with what you know. So these are, that's basically what I do. And here's here look at a whole bunch of trays that I have. And it is very tedious, but you at least know what you're going to end up with. So in, in summary, um, the first part, um, the with crystallization, crystallization of viruses, it follows pretty much the same principles as, as proteins, but there are differences to be aware of in how you um, how the data, uh, how, how diffraction data is collected and, and processed. And crystal size can be controlled by um, by manipulating individual conditions or multiple um, conditions uh, together. And we can scale up the volume. Of, uh, of our crystallization, but we have to calculate the equilibration buffer first for that. And and just to wrap up, I want to acknowledge uh, Brenda Hogue and my lab mates, um, as well as uh, Petra Froma and her lab, where I've learned a lot about, about the basic principles of crystallization, and Nadia, who helped provide some of the data that I included in this uh, presentation, as well as the National Science Foundation. And I didn't mean to cover up the grant numbers there, but, um, but that's just how those boxes slipped in there. So. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions that you guys have.